publishers should pay academics for providing peer review. Uh, in our first session, we heard opening statements uh, from Brad Fenwick and Allison Muddit. And today, and then we had uh, the opportunity to have some discussion with the, uh, with the audience. Um, today, we're going to have uh, six minute responses, first from Dr. James Heathers and second from uh, Dr. Tim Vines. Following the responses, we'll have some more time for Q&A. And then we will take a, a second poll to see which team moved the most votes to their side. Uh, so James, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you everyone at Research at Arita. Uh, I understand we had far more questions uh, than we had time to answer yesterday. So it is inherent upon me to be prompt. Forgive me if I speak more quickly than usual. So, when addressing the question, should peer reviewers be compensated financially, there's always a suggestion that comes up. And it's the question of rewarding reviewers with recognition without involving money. Uh, it came up yesterday, frankly, it's not a bad idea, but if it's a more practical solution because it involves simple recognition, but doesn't involve payment, why have the previous attempts to pursue it been so absent? The only, variant of this I can think of is a private company called Publons. Uh, but publishers, universities, grant giving organizations, governments, etc., have done nothing or very little. It would be trivial to release peer reviews publicly and value them as documents in their own right. Nothing. If we want to be rewarded for a peer review, why not make it a citable document and refer to it? Nothing again. It would be easy to assign identifiers between peer reviews and academic papers. So a paper shop between multiple journals until acceptance isn't reviewed multiple times. Now, there's not no progress on that, just very little. Peer review at Evan is treated the same way as every other common resource before it's regulated, air, water, land, etc. It is treated as infinite and unrewarded because it is allegedly infinite. In other words, there is no downwards pressure on the endless use of academic labor. And the easiest way to exert that pressure is to value the task, not with recognition, but with the traditional way to support skilled labor in every other industry, which is money. We spent yesterday at something of cross purposes. To recap for those of you who have joined us today or have had a busy conference in the meantime or are unaccountably hungover on what is apparently a Wednesday, Brad and I have been arguing that we should pay peer reviewers as an essential part of maintaining the structural integrity of the peer review process in the interest of injecting some efficiency within what has become an increasingly burdensome and on the whole, lower quality enterprise. This will get worse and not better over time. Publication volume doubles every nine years. The academic workforce does not. In fact, in the last year, it's kind of gone the other way. This ever increasing volume cannot be regulated by journals who are either paid by article processing charge or who sell bundled subscriptions to universities which contain an increasing number of titles and volume. Presumably this is why the costs rise so much faster than the rate of inflation. The point is making peer review better, making it future proof towards the inevitability of what will happen to this market, empowering editors to do their jobs and rewarding the people who do the work. And those people are, frankly, primarily young and poor. Research indicates the majority of peer review is performed by graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, and their eventual career rewards is that, depending on the area, somewhere between one in 50 and one in 200 of them will obtain a permanent academic position. 80% of those graduate students I mentioned will leave academia within a decade. Our recognition means nothing to someone on a bad stipend who can't afford their power bills. But the solution we heard from the negative position was, and I'm quoting, paying them for peer review is not going to solve a deeper set of injustices. Let's tackle those injustices directly instead. That proposal is much harder and will generate much more friction than paid peer review, as inequity is baked into the entire structure of how academic systems operate. 
Tackling those injustices involves reviewing tenure structure, mandatory retirement, dramatically increased government support, a change in global publication practices, and a substantial amount of direct support for a constellation of classes of people who are squeezed out of the profession for various social and financial reasons. To turn more broadly to the arguments presented in Auckland, they have focused largely on the perceived impracticalities of paid peer review, which we would note does not answer the question of what should happen, which is the literal topic. The counter arguments have largely amounted to, under the parameters we have assumed, and they are assumptions, this would be hard so we can't do it. Now, I don't want to get bogged down in the details of can't, so I'll confine myself to one example. Although, believe me, others will come up in the question and answer. The idea that paid review is somehow inevitably gamed by dishonest reviewers who cynically review work badly outside of their area of expertise. This assumes that an editor would hire them sight unseen and then discharge a contract with them and then pay them with someone else's money in the absence of looking at the work they produced. In any sane system, a fair percentage of the reviews written today, and many of the reviews I've received personally, would never be considered as candidates for financial reward. But again, regardless of the emptiness that we find within the points of contention, and I could say a lot about innovation here, they are not addressing the question of should, is it obliged or correct? Rather, they are focused on can, are we able to? How we took this topic originally was squarely focused around the question of what is good for the academic enterprise, what best supports the ability to produce knowledge efficiently in the world, and what best supports the people who produce it. Universities and funders have already recognized in many contexts, fewer better papers published faster is better. Paying reviewers moves the entire enterprise in that direction and the status quo does not. Six James, I'm afraid I have to stop you there. You've run out of time. Thank you so much. Now we'll turn the time over to Tim. Right, thanks. Um, okay, so just want to echo a couple of James's points. Um, why have there been so few efforts to reward peer review? Um, largely because if you're actually inside a journal watching this process going on, you can see that there are efforts to reward peer review and it goes on all the time. Good reviewers get elevated to become editors. They become, um, they, their reputation in the community goes up and up. People say, oh, nobody sees these efforts. That is not true. The editor sees them. And editors are very influential people. And in turn, they can promote these people um, both internally and externally. Um, James also said most peer reviewers carried out by grad students and postdocs um, without providing any information about that. That I don't believe is true. Um, I believe most peer review is carried out by pre-tenure faculty and um, sometimes by tenured faculty too. But I don't think most, most journals would view grad students as being appropriate reviewers. Okay, um, so I just wanna jump to uh, my statement here. There he lay, a vast red gold dragon fast asleep Thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail and about him on all sides, stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold, wrought and unwrought, gems and silver, red stained in the ruddy light. That, of course, is an excerpt from The Hobbit, a classic of the fantasy genre. Here's a snippet from a more modern fantasy. Publishers have margins slash excess revenues that allow them to pay reviewers. The trade-off between paying reviewers and the quality slash speed of the review would be reflected in the amount paid, even if this would cause a very minor increase in widely shared subscription pricing or an increase in article processing charge or other fees paid by authors. So although both excerpts do involve imaginary piles of gold, there's really not much comparison. I want to be generous and assume that my esteemed colleagues arguing in favor of the motion were unable to find a pen and an envelope to rough out what paying reviewers would actually add to the cost of uh, publishing an article. I've therefore taken this task on myself. As Dr. Heather recommends, we're going to pay our reviewers $450 per review. We're going to have an average of 2.2 reviews per article, which is very typical for a journal, and each Reviewed article therefore costs $990. That is, we're gonna, every article that we put through peer review is gonna cost $990. Of 
Of course, an APC, article processing charge, is only paid by the articles that get accepted for publication. And the cost of reviewing the rejected ones is loaded into the APC. For a journal with a 25% acceptance rate, they have to review four articles in order to find one that they accept. Multiplying 990 by four gives us $3,960. This is the raw amount that we would need to add to an APC to pay each reviewer $450 for their review. Think about that for a moment. This is the very minor increase our esteemed colleagues are suggesting, an additional $4,000 per accepted article in a traditional journal. And that's ignoring the cost of administering the peer reviewer fees and ignoring the fact that $450 is probably on the low side for an expert reviewer. And when they are able to negotiate the price themselves, that will probably go up. Our colleagues, arguing favor didn't present this calculation and it seems very likely they haven't even attempted it and how else could you dismiss four thousand dollars as being a very minor increase and that's just one paper just look, imagine what this would look like across an entire industry as we heard from my colleagues yesterday the additional cost from plos would be up 40 million dollars per year more than doubling their total and annual expenditures that is a phenomenal amount of money and that's just one moderate sized publisher this proposal would have had hundreds, if not millions of dollars to the cost of communicating research each year. And surely, surely that money we better spent on the research itself and on solving our most pressing global challenges. And I can't end without briefly touching on the nightmarish administrative burden and expense that this proposal would add to. Contracts prepared, negotiated and executed for every single review. Millions of dollars right there. But let's Let's just say we're able to jump that particular hurdle. How on earth would these contracts be enforced? Who wades into the mind of minefield deciding what is and what isn't a quality review? Does anyone who has worked with reviewers think that a simple contract is gonna make them deliver on time? What kind of punitive measures do our opponents have in mind to make this happen? Our opponents yesterday asked us to focus on the goals of increasing both the speed and the quality of the peer review process, but it seems either naive or disingenuous not to acknowledge the scale of the challenge and the additional expenses inherent in the proposal. They seem content to stick to vague, hopeful statements about the virtues of paying reviewers without putting much thought into how it would work in practice. And that, audience, is all you need to know about their argument. Thanks very much, Tim. You came in just under the wire. Well done. All right, so now uh, we're going to start uh, entertaining some questions from the audience, some of which have already come in. So the first one uh, comes from Phil Jones, who says, I don't know about how, I don't know how prevalent it is, but it is common in my experience for faculty to ask their students and postdocs to actually do the reviews, but then the PI submits it. Uh, so really more of a statement than a question. Any any comments or responses to that? Yes, it's called academic ghostwriting and it's very common. If you want to read a good article, there's one from 2017 by uh, McDowell, I believe. Um, if you want to find out exactly how the split of this breaks down, there's also information on peerage of science, which indicate the figures that I presented initially. It's increasingly common and it is something of a, a statement of honesty, in my opinion, when professors hand that task off to people they work with who are junior to them, and then ask the journal to reassign the review so they're given appropriate credit. Especially within the life sciences, this does not happen very much. It makes the uh, official distortion of how this process is actually performed very difficult to collectively understand, but there is research on it and it does happen a lot. Any other uh, comments or responses? Um, well, some might argue that's called reviewer training, which everyone argues needs to happen more, is that junior people work with the senior faculty in assessing the article. Um, in the field I worked in, it barely happened at all. Uh, and when it did happen, it was acknowledged by the reviewer when they submitted it. So I suppose we can go round and round about it. It's very hard to peer into the black box, but um, Either way, I don't think so. Grad students don't tend to review; it tends to be more seen postdocs. Um, let's go. Let's carry on. 
Uh, so the next question is from Katrina McCallum, and actually it's, it's really the same observation. Uh, one of the issues in peer review is that faculty ask to review, get their graduate students to do the work, but don't let the journal know. ECRs, early career researchers, suffer in the system in many ways. Uh, the next question uh, from Stuart Taylor. Um, this is directed at Tim, and, and I saw that this question came in, Tim, while you were talking about the um, significant costs that uh, peer review payment would impose on the system. Uh, the question says, uh, but only if you load all the peer review costs on the accepted authors, why not spread it out more? Um, well, you certainly could spread it out more. It doesn't change the overall amount. Um, in that there would have to be then a submission fee or a peer review fee of $990 per article just to cover the cost of paying the reviewers. Um, and also I just want to step back, something I should have said, uh, to the previous point about um, senior researchers getting their ECRs to do the reviews, this would be also be invisible to the system of paying reviewers, uh, and presumably the money would flow to the PI and maybe they'd give a little bit to their junior researcher. But it, uh, trying to funnel money to ECRs through their PIs um, would seem vastly inefficient and um, a very leaky pipeline in terms of paying ECRs for that work. Well, it would seem like a breach of contract if the contract was properly constructed. Let me just respond to that very quickly. About half the respondents have ghostwritten a peer review report despite 81% responding that ghostwriting is unethical and 82% agreeing that identifying co-reviewers to the journal is valuable. How would you enforce that? How would you ever tell? Sorry, clarify. How, from the journal side, could you tell that the review was ghostwritten and not written by the PI? Well, you have exactly the same problem that you have now. You just have the additional problem that if you have a contract in place, then the person is forced to fill it out with information that is literally not the case. It's potentially wire fraud if it's bad enough. Generally, things like that act as downwards incentives. Perhaps, perhaps. It seems very complicated, though, to then wade into trying to enforce that contract. But sure, let's carry on. Uh, so we've had a couple of uh, questions that, that really are, are comments. Uh, from Mary Purton, we, off we offer to invite the ECR to review under their own name, and many PIs do this. Um, Sally Rumsey asks, if the PI submits, how to ensure that the uh, PG student gets the money? I think this maybe goes to the question that James just asked, or, or that Tim just asked. Uh, any any comments on how how to ensure that the money goes to the person who actually wrote the review? Yeah, you put it as a contract stipulation that you're performing the task entirely yourself, and that it needs to be reassigned. Well, I, I mean, think that speaks to this. Allison. I was going to say I think that speaks to the central challenge. I mean, I understand. The idea of having a contract that sets all of this out and therefore somehow codifies what's supposed to happen. But I think it's completely unrealistic to expect that anybody is going to have either the time, the expertise or the scale to be able to manage and monitor hundreds of thousands of additional new contracts across the publishing system. Just not going to happen. Apparently, DocuSign is something that only happened to other people. These things are almost invariably drawn off a template. I've signed one this morning. Uh, yeah, there's, there's obviously, obviously there's, there's, there's problems with the integration of the databasing. But with, within all of this, we, we have, we, we're essentially shooting the horse before it's had a chance to race here. There's been absolutely no place in any of this discussion about the role of innovation and what's actually happening in financial services right now and in the last 10 years. It is very, very hard to believe that uh, companies who manage more than a billion yearly downloads uh, will somehow find it impossible to do contract and payment management. You can, you can build a journal from scratch for less of the cost of an APC now. This is a, the, the SaaS space is put so many efficiencies into this process for so many other industries. I fail to see how it's somehow completely irrelevant to the academic market. James, let me abuse my, my role as moderator here and ask a, a follow-up question. Uh, you, you, um, 
is this horse actually racing anywhere right now? Are, are there are there journals that are paying reviewers and having success with that model? Uh, that's actually a Brad question who has a direct experience with this. At least not that I know of. Um, I think there's indirect compensation going on, but not direct. Um, but I think it's a model that needs to be tested uh, in terms of does is the trade-off. And, and I would just point out is the sort of, you know, it's going to cost this much, so it's going to tear the system down. It's a value proposition. If, if um, peer reviews that produce qual more higher quality publications um, and does that faster, what's the value of that to the scientific community? So in fact, what, I might, what might very well happen is fewer papers get submitted because the costs go up. And that is actually a big threat to publishers that are based on APCs that have to accept so many papers just to keep their uh, cash flow stable. Alison, what were you going to say? Yeah, I'd just like to add quickly, I was actually involved with an experiment at a journal when I was at University of California Press, um, Calabra, which experimented with this idea of a revenue share model. Um, it's just been discontinued because it had it had um, it just didn't cover its cost. It was getting so little interest um, from researchers. That's backed up by a 2018 Publon, Publon survey that found that only 17% of respondents selected cash or in-kind payment as something that would make them more likely to accept review requests. So I think the central premise of our opponent's argument that this will A, speed up review and be increased quality of review is really undermined by the data that we have out there from researchers themselves. That sample is drawn directly James, from let, the Publons database just... of all people who are happy to receive credit. It's, it's a sample of their users, essentially, not the broader academic market. Sorry, Rick, go on. Oh, I, I'd like us to be able to get to one last question because we literally only have three minutes left. Um, this is from Tasha Mellons Cohen rather than thinking per article would paid boards of reviewers per journal with an annual stipend like those paid to some editors in return for specific numbers of peer reviews ease the challenge of micropayments and micro contracts. So does payment for reviewers have to be on a per review basis or could, could it be done on a stipend basis and would that be, would that solve the problem better? The answer is we don't know, but the, but the innovation, the idea flow the possibility is what this is all about. It's, it is, you know, should we? Now the question is, how do we? Right. Allison? I think it's a really good idea and I think it's worth testing out, but that does, still doesn't answer the central question that our opponents have not answered. Where does the money come from? This is additional money. Many publishers, including societies, nonprofits, are operating on really tight margins. No one has addressed the question of where the additional money comes from. If, I would just say if the value's there uh, and it's a value proposition, uh, then um, the um, system would pay for it. I think it would have to be a hell of a value to justify almost doubling the cost base of science publishing. But you're, you're assuming it's 450. It could be a whole lot less. And as the data that Allison uh, mentioned, for some, it could be zero. They don't need it. 450 is what I want to get paid. It's not a proposal for everyone. It's a proposal for me. This is a point that I left out of the original uh, section of the response here. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, the position that Brad and I have come from is as a market mechanism. That payment is reflective of what I want. I just asked for it. What happens on a macro scale is a completely separate question. Well, thanks so much, everybody. With that, we're going to have to end. And I'm going to ask Claire to uh, put up the, the poll. As a reminder, while she's doing that, um, in the, the initial vote, uh, out of 64 votes, was 41% or 26 votes in favor of the proposition and 59% against. Now, as Claire is putting up the poll, I, I have to ask, this is very important. If you didn't vote initially, please don't vote now because what we're going to do is we're going to look for, and if you did vote initially, please do vote again. 
because what we're going to be looking for is to see which team moved the largest number of votes from the previous uh, from the other position into their position and uh, the team that has done so will be declared the winner with all the glory and honor that comes with that. Uh, so we'll give you another <laughs> minute or so to uh, get your votes in and I'll, I'll wait for Claire to let me know what the results are. And in the meantime, Tim will sing a song. <laughs> I thought you want the orders to stay around. Not... <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as they voted, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure All I'm right. Asking, I'm it looks like, wow, we have a very, very clear result. Uh, the, the result of the second vote is 16% in favor, 84% <laughs> against. So out of, uh, that's out of 50 voters. So a, a sizable number of our audience uh, was, was convinced that uh, journal publishers should not pay academics for providing peer review. Everyone, I, I want to thank uh, our, our attendees, everyone who's participated and provided wonderful questions, but especially I want to thank Allison, James, Tim, and Brad uh, for the outstanding contribution they've made uh, to the program. Uh, thank you so much for your cogent and compelling arguments and uh, with that, um, we will be uh, moving next to the panel on the C-19 Rapid Review Project, um, which is going to be ready to start in just a minute or two. Uh, in the meantime, please take a moment to rate and comment on this session using the participant survey. Um, and then when you're ready to join the Rapid Review Project session, just go to the timeline and select that agenda item. Thanks again, everyone. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>